Right. right, well, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure uh, to speak with you today uh, with Dr. Paul Sachs. Uh, my name is Marina Klein. I am at McGill University in Montreal, where I'm an infectious disease specialist and researcher. and um, the, I'm very pleased to be moderating this uh, presentation today on an overview of data presented at the 2023 International AIDS Conference. Uh, and we're very lucky to have with us Dr. Sachs, who's probably well known to you and needs very little introduction, but he's the clinical director of the Division of Infectious Disease at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he's well known uh, as, as a brilliant teacher, uh, and nationally and internationally, also for research involving uh, antiretrovirals and the cost effectiveness analyses. And he really brings a great uh, insight to the data that was presented at this international meeting. Thanks. Slide. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, and I'll just, uh, before we move on with the presentation, I just wanna to bring to your attention a few things. These are the financial relationships uh, uh, with uh, the content uh, of people on the board on this slide. Uh, these are our financial relationships uh, with the uh, various institutions. I want to remind you that the, the ISA USC designates this activity for a maximum of 1.25 uh, AMA credits. And the same uh, is true for these organizations, for nurses and pharmacies, pharmacists. Um, uh, we have uh, this activity is supported by these uh, uh, companies. And just it's really important because we like to keep this presentation open for questions and interactive uh, activities. So there will be separate polls that are introduced and you'll see a window and pop up when that comes along. Also, we really encourage you all to submit questions and please use the Q&A button, which I will monitor and we'll try to address those along the way of the presentation. But as the presentation closes, we have a good 15 minutes devoted to uh, address uh, questions from the audience. So please uh, use this. So we look forward to seeing uh, what you have to ask. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sachs. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein. And by the way, feel free to use my first name and I'm going to use yours. So I'm Paul, you're Absolutely. Marina. Absolutely, Marina. <laughs> okay. Let me uh, start by sharing my screen. Slides visible? Great. So uh, I was very lucky. I got a chance to go to Brisbane for the first time, uh, and uh, it's in Australia, so a very long way, uh, even though the cost of the in-person registration isn't that much different from the virtual registration, the cost of the travel is substantially more, but fortunately, uh, my wife and I were able to stay a few extra days for vacation. So um, this is some uh, of the data that you've already seen on uh, conflicts, and this is the learning objectives, uh, and it's really to summarize the clinically important research that was presented at AIDS 2023. Um, Brisbane is an absolutely gorgeous uh, city. It's located on the Brisbane River. It was sort of interesting. I, I, I realized that very rarely is the name of the city the same as the river that runs through it or past it. Almost many, many cities are on rivers, but not many are on a river that's called the same thing. Um, but the uh, aerial view here, this is one of the many pedestrian and bike bridges that goes over the river and the uh, along the riverside here, there's a riverside park that goes on for for many, uh, many miles. It's really wonderful. And you can walk long, long distances past uh, parks, past cafes, past um, playgrounds. And of course, it was right in the middle of their winter. 
uh, which meant that it was a, a freezing uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the afternoon with perfect sunshine. Uh, the weather was was absolutely perfect the, the whole time. Uh, so it was a very good time to visit the city. All right, the first uh, question is really a, a kind of a clinical practice question. Um, approximately how many newly diagnosed people with HIV do you care for in a one year period? And you see there's a little pop-up window that you get to vote. And we get to have a little delay uh, until we see the results. This is uh, not a, not a pretest question. Okay, we have everything from zero to more than 12 and a fairly even distribution along all of those lines. Okay, now we're gonna do some pretest questions related to content that I will be presenting. And I'll read the question, which of the following best describes the results of a PK study of Bictegravir, FTC, TAF in, during pregnancy compared with non-pregnant adults and study participants? A, Bictegravir levels were unchanged. B, Bictegravir levels were reduced and below estimated levels required to suppress HIV. C, Bictegravir levels were reduced, but still above estimated levels to, to suppress HIV. Or D, Bictegravir levels were increased with more treatment-related adverse events. So those are your options. You have uh, uh, four choices. And once again, you'll hear data to support the correct answer during the course of this presentation. So if you're thinking of falling asleep, um, please, uh, please don't do so. Okay, thank you. And next is in the open label extension phase of HPTN 084, which of the following best describes the selection of pre-exposure prophylaxis by the women who participated a, more women chose oral therapy. B, more women chose injectable cabotegravir. C, there was no clear preference for either treatment option. Or D, most women elected not to participate in the open label extension. And go ahead and vote. This is comparing cabotegravir with TDF FTC. All right, there we go. So um, starting off the review, I can't help but start, but with this study, which is Reprieve, which was presented early in the conference by Steve Grinspoon, the lead author. Uh, and he simultaneously announced the publication of the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. And here is that evidence of that. That was an interesting study because you notice it doesn't have much to do with infectious diseases. It's patavastatin to prevent cardiovascular disease and HIV. Uh, the lead author, Steve Grinspoon, he's a uh, colleague of mine, a longtime Boston colleague of mine, but he's an endocrinologist. He's the uh, lead author and the senior author is Pam Douglas, a cardiologist. You'll notice there are some ID doctors scattered in the, in the masthead here, including um, our good friends, Carl Fitchenbaum, Judy Aberg, Judy Courier, and others, but this is a study of uh, non-infectious complication of HIV. And uh, Steve st stood in front of the, the, the assembled packed house, and he said, it's a very simple study, and it's kind of a joke because any study that has nearly 8,000 people in it, you know, can't be that simple. Um, but there was a simple randomized clinical trial design patients assigned to placebo or patavastatin four milligrams. And to be eligible for the study, you had to have low to moderate estimated cardiovascular risk. So people for whom you might not otherwise prescribe a statin also be older than 40. Now there was a mechanistic sub-study in there. We didn't see the results of that, but interestingly enough, a little background story, Steve initially planned this study as a mechanistic study looking at coronary plaque, vascular inflammation, immune activation. And he did do that study, but he was encouraged by the uh, powers that be at the NIH to do a fully powered clinical endpoint study, which is what we see here. Uh, and the primary endpoint, as shown in the slide, is 
a major cardiovascular event. And the list of potential cardiovascular events is shown down here. Um, study was enrolled in multiple parts of the world, everywhere but Europe, for reasons that are not quite clear to me. But we had enrollments, of course, in the United States and Canada and uh, North America, you know, Mexico, Caribbean, South America, um, enrollments in, uh, in Asia, enrollments in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it was a study that was um, about 70% men and 30% uh, women. So a decent participation of women, but more reflective of what we see in in developing country, in developed countries, more like uh, the distribution of HIV in the United States, um, but representative of that population. And um, a wide uh, divergence of, of rage, ra races. And this is the uh, cardiovascular risk score on this slide. You can see that that most of the people were at low to moderate risk, you know, 75% had a predicted uh, 10 year cardiovascular event rate of under 7.5%. Uh, so these, as I said, are people for whom you might not even think about giving a statin. Um, and then it was a very healthy population. Uh, everyone had to be on art and suppressed. And so the vast majority were when they when enrolled in the study. So uh, studies churning along, I have to say, we were one of the study sites. We enrolled about 50 people. It's actually, you know, seeing people in follow-up in the study, they're taking either a placebo or a patavastatin pill, which is pretty small, four milligrams. And then lo and behold, early in 2023, actually in March, I believe it was, the study was stopped, stopped for a significant benefit of patavastatin over placebo, a 35% reduction in major cardiovascular events. And this was seen pretty much across baseline demographics and subgroups. And if you combine it with a cardiovascular event or death, it's a 21% reduction. And the Data Safety Monitoring Board did feel that this was a sufficient enough benefit for them to stop the study early. There was no point in continuing. Now, of course, the risk of cardiovascular events was different depending on your baseline cardiovascular risk, regardless of whether you got patavastatin or placebo. And that's shown in here along the horizontal axis is the uh, enrollment risk score. Um, and then along the vertical axis is the estimated incidence. And this is the lowest risk and this is the highest risk. And what this translates into is a decreasing number needed to treat to prevent one major event with an increasing cardiovascular risk score. So if you look at the people at the highest risk, we're talking about 30 to 50 people to treat to prevent one major cardiovascular event. If you're looking, looking at the people lowest risk, it would be more like 200 to prevent one event. And overall, it was about 100. And the comparison was made to treating hypertension, giving aspirin, and this does compare favorably to that particular number needed to treat. Uh, treating 100 people to prevent a major cardiovascular event, high, high blood pressure, essential high, high blood pressure for primary prevention uh, is in that range. So when you look at the um, side effects, you can see that the uh, placebo arm has a lower incidence of diabetes than metavastatin. And you know one of the sort of ironic things about statin studies is that they typically do show a uh, slightly elevated risk of diabetes in a patient population for whom that's the last thing you want. But when you kind of talk to the statinologists, uh, they, they have reassured that most of these are people who would probably have developed diabetes soon anyway. Um, and the overall benefit greatly exceeds the risk. By way of reassurance, this is the patavastatin diabetes incidence. This is the general population. So independent of the study and you can see there's a lot of overlap here. The other side effect that people talk about a lot with statins is, is myalgias or muscle aches. And as you can see with pistavastatin in blue and placebo in orange, there is a slightly higher risk of myalgias and muscle aches in the pistavastatin group than in the placebo group. 
but it was an extremely infrequent cause of treatment discontinuation. So uh, I'm gonna throw some questions up here. I'm gonna invite Dr. Klein to weigh in on any of these that you would like. Is this practice changing? What about people, is this a special effect because people with HIV have higher cardiovascular risk? What if we used a different statin? Because certainly before this study, I had never used patavastatin. Uh, Marina, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think without a doubt, and I, I think you um, could see the interest in the study at the meeting, uh, that this is really uh, one of those singular times where you have a practice changing study in HIV. Uh, uh, you know, just the sheer size of the study the, and the confidence we can have in, in the effects uh, that were observed, I think. It definitely has to make us rethink uh, how we approach the use of statins in our low to moderate risk population. And like you say, for me, these are people who I always would reassure and say, okay, I don't think, you know, and you kind of watch their cholesterol go creeping up a little bit over time. And, and, and you always wonder, should we or not? Um, and so it, I, your, your point about HIV, I do think this is a different population. We know that the rates of, of cardiovascular disease are elevated. Uh, we know that a lot of factors are responsible for that, uh, not only uh, the drugs that people have been exposed to, but HIV itself appears to have an atherogenic uh, promotional effect. Uh, and so it's perhaps not surprising, uh, though I think we were a little surprised about how, how uh, great the result was. I don't, I don't know what you think about that, but I, I was a bit surprised. Well, you know, this is why you do big studies. I, I, uh, I have to say, we, you know, we enrolled about 50 people into this study at our study site, and there wasn't a single cardiovascular event among them because they were at low to moderate risk. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but but if you do a study of 8,000 people, then you start to see some benefits. Uh, any experience with patavastatin? So no, so this is a problem actually for us in Canada. We were also uh, part of this study, but uh, it's not uh, licensed in Canada and it's not likely to be licensed in Canada. There's no, yeah. doesn't appear to be any uh, appetite for it. I mean, statins are incredibly cheap uh, and are generic. Many of them are generic. So I think this is the question that we get most is, can we substitute in another commonly used statin such yeah. as a statin? Uh, will we get the same effect? Um, I, don't, I think so. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I talked, but, I talked to a cardiologist and he said, undoubtedly you would. Yeah. Uh, he was very confident. But then again, he's a cardiologist. They tend to be confident. Yeah. So, but I too would never, and patavastatin is still branded in the United States, so we almost never prescribe it. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, it was a very uh, packed house that he was presenting it to. In fact, it was so packed that, you know, I was worried we were going to, you know, trigger some major super spreader infectious disease because we were all, you know, crammed in there, people sitting in the aisles and lined up in the hall, you know, not standing up and lined up outside. Um, sometimes the conference planners, they get everything right, but this one, one thing, and this is one of those. It's and then pretty I pretty predictable, this, uh, I think. I don't know how they mixed it up, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly. I put this on here because this is what it felt like. I, I don't know if, uh, anyone wants to write in the chat or what they, if they recognize this particular scene, this is a very famous scene. All right. So now we're going to have a polling question, uh, a 52 year old man with stable HIV seen for follow-up. He's currently receiving bacteria to c TAF and no other medications. He has a 10-year calculated cardiovascular risk score of 4.7%. What would you recommend? No statin, patavastatin, a different statin, such as a torvastatin. All right, I know what Marina would recommend because... <laughs> She can't use patavastatin. Patavastatin, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see what the group said. 50% uh, said a different statin, such as a torvastatin. That's the most popular answer. 32% said patavastatin, and 18% said no statin. I think, you know, you look at this group with the very the sort of this is under 5% risk, and the number needed to treat there is probably about 100 and 50 or so. And it's a, it's an interesting, interesting, it's going to be interesting. The group who I think it, this study really hits home for are the people at five to 7.5% and 7.5 to 10%. If you were holding, we were holding off on them, then 
they really should go ahead and give them a give them a statin drug. One other thing to mention about this study, which is really interesting, is they're going to have lots of other endpoints. And you know, remember the leading cause of death in people with HIV who are in treatment now is cancer. And during the course of the study, because it was so large, they had a lot of cancer incidents. And wouldn't it be something if we see a if we see a signal of cancer prevention from the the statin? Because statins, just to use the most commonly used word, they have pleiotropic effects. It's not just about lipid lowering. And indeed, in this study, the cardiovascular risk reduction was greater than would be predicted solely from the lipid lowering effect, uh, probably an anti-inflammatory effect that is uh, well described in statin studies. All right, going to leave uh, cardiovascular disease and move on to treatment naive people with HIV. The first study is uh, Deravirine Aslatravir versus Bictegravir FTC TAF. This is a phase three non-inferiority trial, double-blinded, uh, primary endpoint, 48-week uh, viral suppression. You'll notice the inclusion criteria. Otherwise, uh, I also notice that this is the 0 0.75 milligram dose of Aslatravir. This dose uh, we know is associated with some degree of bone marrow suppression. Uh, lymphocytes, I should say, as well as uh, CD4 cell counts. And the results is the first time we've seen a treatment naive study of, of a novel treatment in some time. So, uh, Islantravir, as you all know, is the investigational reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, very, very potent, very long acting. And Deraverine is, of course, Deraverine. Uh, and uh, results uh, show here their non inferiority was demonstrated. You have uh, 89% and 88% in the Deraverine Slatrevir arm versus Bictegravir FTC TAF. There was one person in the uh, experimental arm, the Deraverine Slatrevir arm, who developed resistance. There were no people with virologic failure and resistance in the Bictegravir arm, and observed was the predictable decline in. CD4 and total lymphocyte count. Let's take a little further look. This is the one person who had resistance. Um, they apparently started with a high, very high viral load. They were not very adherent to therapy. Uh, and they selected for signature deraverine resistance mutations, in particular 106A, as well as the 184V mutation, like, sorry, 184I, which is very similar to 184V. This is a mutation that is known to cause decreased susceptibility to a slatrophere, but not enough to cause full loss of activity. Then the figure shows uh, just the difference between the slatrophere arm and the bictegravir arm in terms of uh, CD4 cell count. And see, there's quite a bit of overlap, but there is a lower response in the slatrophere arm. Now we have in this study, we have, if you take a look at this study, you have one, you know, a, a regimen that does not include an integrase inhibitor, does not include TAF, compared to one that includes both. And one must wonder what, what are the weight changes going to be? And uh, bingo, uh, they're pretty much the same. Um, at week 48, there's no significant difference between weight gain between the two between the two regimens, between the two regimens. So this is a regimen that is currently being tested again at the 0 0.25 milligram Islatravir dose. And let's uh, imagine that it's, it's again gonna be non-inferior. We don't know that yet, the study's ongoing. Um, again, a question for you, Marina, is you know, what characteristics do you think this regimen would have that would distinguish it from other single pill options? Yeah, I mean, well, I guess the, the main difference between most of the current single pill options is the lack of NRTI. So if you are a believer that we want to spare kind of long-term exposure to nucleoside, nucleosides over time, uh, that would be something. 
um, it's really an interesting combination, I guess, in terms of if you think of where is this going to be placed and, and is it going to have a, you know, a role for the moment, you kind of see it as a little niche role for certain types of people who might otherwise not be good candidates uh, for the, you know, the tried and true current uh, single tablet regimens. Uh, I think is latrovir is a super interesting drug, and uh, but this might not be where it's going to finally land as being of most use. Uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, it does. I don't know. Yeah, it does raise the question of whether a latrovir alone will ever be developed, because yeah. you know we know about a latrovir and this combination once a day, and there's a latrovir with lenacapavir under investigation okay. once a week. Um, but uh, is there interest in hislantrovir for people with NRTI resistance or just, I don't know, it's, 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 it's useful to have the separate components of regimens, you know, the, but there's obviously a company motivation to, to have them FDA approved with their companion medications, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, I, I do think there's, there is you know, such high intracellular concentrations that at least based on modeling, the 0 0.25 milligram dose should work. Uh, work. That's, that's uh, still to be proven in the clinical trial. Yeah, I think the long acting potential for that drug is one where you have to kind of, you know, envision maybe it has an, another better partner. And, yeah, uh, exactly. But this uh, allows me to shift to talk a, just a bit more about deraverine. Um, you know, when we learned about NNRTI resistance back in the in the old days, you know, you learned about K103N and Y181C and 238K. You know, those are mutations that associated with efavirenz, nevirapine, and uh, ropivirine, respective, respectively. But deraverine is a little different, and so there was a presentation in the prospective phase three studies with TDF and 3TC the 106A or M mutation was selected most commonly, um, at least among NNRTI mutations. But I just want to highlight that those are very different from the mutations seen with efavirenz and ropivirine. I don't know if this means we could then use anyway uh, injectable ropivirine as part of long-acting treatment, probably never be tested, but it's an interesting thought. And then I do want to put in parentheses down here at the bottom, there are historical resistance mutations that some of our most treatment experienced patients have, in particular this Y18L that causes uh, almost complete loss of activity of deraverine, in fact does. So I would just assume it's completely resistant, even though I don't think there's been a case of deraverine selecting this mutation. But if you have a patient with that in their historical genotype, they will not be successfully treated with deraverine and I would avoid it. A few more studies. This is another treatment naive study, kind of unusual study. Um, it was done in South America, uh, and it was a randomization between open label, between dolotegravir lamivudine and dolotegravir plus TDF XTC, asking the question, do you really need the genotype results? Remember, 184V is not a commonly transmitted mutation, and there are 100 or so people in each arm. And, you know, I don't really understand the rationale behind the week 24 analysis unless they wanted to make sure that there was just no, no disasters because uh, there's no genotype information yet. Uh, but if you do that, you know, an early look, do you then present the results? Because uh, this, the this is what we, we saw. We saw the early results, week 24, and we didn't see the genotypes because oh, ultimately that, they are going to reveal the genotypes, but we're not going to know till the end. Um, you know, kind of interesting study design. Uh, and then the, the, another interesting thing about it is the proportion of people with high viral loads and low CD4s was a bit higher than we see in, in other phase three studies. And the results look good so far, you know, got nearly 95% suppressed or nine, 94, 95% suppressed, uh, very, very low, uh, failure rate, no, no one with resistance emergent, meeting the non-inferiority threshold so far. Uh, as a parenthetical aside, um, actually saw more weight in the two-drug arm than the three-drug arm, 
And notice that the three drug arm has tenofovir DF. Uh, and you can sort of add this to your long list of studies that I know you're accumulating in your research brains showing that there's a weight suppressive effect of TDF and that the absence of TDF is uh, associated with greater weight gain. Now this weight gain in these treatment naive individuals is probably mostly due to good things, improvement in health, but still uh, TDF seems to suppress weight. So I don't know if this uh, has an impact on your clinical practice, uh, Marina, what do you think? I mean, no, <laughs> not right now, but that's partly because, you know, you asked a question earlier about how many new patients you see a year. And, you know, we're, we're sadly seeing uh, many, many, like my myself are seeing two a week. Wow. Because of, yeah, we had about 350 new patients in the last- Wait, new, new, new diagnoses. New diagnoses. And this is the reason is they're coming as new immigrants, refugees. Um, ah. And this is, you know, something that, Canada in particular has been experiencing, but I'm, I know the United States is, is also, many of them are actually transiting through the U.S., so they're, they are sometimes being there. So, so yes, it's reassuring. I think it's absolutely reassuring that we don't have to worry so much about genotyping prior to starting a dual regimen, but many of these people, we don't know their past history at all and, and can't be certain, and you'll, I, I think you're going to talk to this in, in future slides about, you know, what's the role of the 184B in, when you're using yeah. a two regimen. I think we're still a little uncomfortable in, in going that way until there's more data uh, yeah. uh, genotyping because it takes us, you know, six weeks to get a genotype. So we, and we want to start as rapidly as possible. So, uh, yeah. you know, if it takes you six weeks to get a genotype back, I can definitely see the argument for choosing three drugs. It takes us about one week. Yes. So we're, you know, I, I don't know. Sometimes Canada is it's better like a than middle the middle income setting here. <laughs> Sometimes U.S. is better than Canada. I don't know. Now, all I can tell you is uh, we don't use much two-drug therapy as initial treatment. We use mostly as a switch strategy. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, but I found this study interesting anyway as a strategy yeah. study. Yeah. I look forward to seeing the week 48 results. And I, I'm sure that someone knows how to pronounce that word, but I don't. Uh, all right. Uh, another study that I think was very reflective of clinical practice, and that's why I'm highlighting it here. It was Andrew Hill from UK and South Africa. He, he showed in an analysis of the advanced study, which as you recall, was a three-arm study in treatment naive people who got either two different dolotegravir regimens or efavirenz, TDF-FTC efavirenz, that if they experienced virologic failure and then had uh, adherence interventions without switching the regimen, they then were followed for resuppression, resuppression. And look at this blue line. These are the people on the dolotegravir regimens. The resuppression rate is incredibly high and significantly higher than the efavirenz strategy. And, you know, I guess this is predictable, but it's great to see. I mean, it certainly supports what we do in clinical practice when someone, say, has a lapse in care and they don't refill their prescriptions for a while and then they come in and they're virologic rebound, but they've been receiving a dolotegravir or bictegravir-based regimen, we typically don't change them anymore. And that makes sense here uh, based on these data. I am assuming that this group, the group in the efavirenz strategy, that they had some degree of fabrins resistance. So. <laughs> it's like the boosted PI story in the past. I think we had the same sort of, you know, confidence with using. Exactly, exactly. How much uh, hepatitis B HIV co-infection do you see? A uh, oh, fair amount, actually. Yeah, you get the, again because of the po patient population we're serving a lot from Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, this is the largest treatment naive study in this population. It's the Alliance trial. Um, we saw the week 48 results and it compared Bictegravir FTC TAF with Dolotegravir plus FTC TDF. And the uh, viral load results in that 48 week analysis showed HIV very similar, hepatitis B suppression better with Bictegravir FTC TAF. So these are now 
96 week results. HIV viral load suppression is still about the same. And now the TDF arm is catching up to the TAF arm. So this is no longer significantly favoring the TAF group, um, implying that viral suppression is faster with TAF for hepatitis B, but not overall better uh, in the long run. There were, however, some outcomes that favored the favored the TAF arm still, uh, hepatitis B, E antigen loss, um, seroconversion, and then surface antigen loss all favored the TAF arm. Whether the TDF arm will eventually catch up is, is unclear. Um, I don't know about you, but when I saw this, I thought this is incredibly high rates yeah. of surface antigen loss. And then it occurred to me that I don't even check for that. And maybe I should. Well, I do check for it, actually. You do. <laughs> and and I, I don't see rates like this. And I think this may actually reflect the population where this study was done, which is uh, Thailand, I think, right? So most, most, of the, most of the participants were enrolled, were enrolled in Asia. In Asia, and I, and it, I think it's 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 different. The the rates of uh, antigen loss may be higher in in those genotypes and in that population than we see. I I was like I at when I first saw these results, I just didn't you know it's hard to believe them because we just don't see this happen so often. So it's really interesting, I, and I'd really like to see how this turns out and and why you see this difference between the two two strategies. Yeah, I actually um, was. Uh was unaware that there there's faster there's there's more surface antigen loss in asia than in other parts of the world i think some of the studies that i've seen from oh. there in certain genotypes so you see it yeah higher okay yeah. Interesting. In, in a non not not hiv infected populations i'm talking yeah about. sure sure um anyway at the very least the alliance study proves that taf is at least as good if not better than tdf for hep b i think that's much we can say um so now on to treatment experience patients. Uh, this is a very unusual study. So let me let's walk, a, walk us through it. This is uh, um, people with um, a very certain patient population. And it's the, looking at the strategy of switching them all to dolutegavir lamivudine. So to be in this trial, they had to have, be on any regimen, uh, virologically suppressed, and a history of prior virologic failure, and they could have resistance to anything. Um, that's uh, they were allowed to be in this study, and then uh, the study, as I mentioned, everyone switched to dolutegavir-lamivudine, and this is not a randomization. These arrows, this just describes two groups. One group had known historical 184V or I, and the other group had no known historical V or I. And then they're followed uh, longitudinally. And I, I'm going to spend a little time with the baseline characteristics because it's kind of important. The first thing I want to mention is how incredibly treatment experienced this group was. This is a group of patients who've been on treatment for you know one to three decades. Uh, that's a long, long time. Second, they'd received multiple prior regimens. And third, probably most importantly, they had a prolonged duration of viral suppression before entering the study. Now you'll note there are lots of significant p-values here. That's because this is not a randomized trial. People with historical 184V resistance are going to differ from those who don't. They're going to be older. They're going to be more likely to have longer history of HIV. Look at that, 28 years. Um, lower CD4 nadir, uh, history of CD4 less than 200, et cetera. So the, the populations are, are quite different, but all of them had prolonged viral suppression. And then uh, one of the uh, kind of the comments that Trip Gulick made is that a bunch of the people, fully half, were receiving a bacavir lamivudine dolutegravir, which is actually an unusual regimen to be receiving if you have historical 184V, because most of people avoid that regimen under that context. So this is selecting for a group doing well, uh, suppressed for a long time, 
The last section is this historical genotype versus provile genotype. And I just want you to focus on this group here, historical 184V known from prior genotypes. You can see that the, the uh, proviral genotype picked it up in 37% uh, of, of cases. So missed it in 63%. Well, results are shown here, uh, 96 weeks, there's viral suppression, 4% viral rebound in the 184V group, 2% in the no 184V group, and there was nobody who developed new resistance uh, at the time of failure, and there was no difference either in the blips and low-level viremia. So this is the conclusion of the study through 96 weeks. Uh, Solar confirmed, Solar 3D confirms prior history, current presence of 184V doesn't impact the efficacy of switching virologically suppressed adults with multiple prior virologic failures. Uh, do you agree with that statement? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm still a, a little uncomfortable in some of these situations yeah. for the reasons you pointed out. I think these are selecting to some extent, you know, already successful patients. And they, I, if I understood the slide about the proviral DNA, they couldn't actually, you know, sequence everyone. So there may have been people, yeah. you know, who, yeah, who had in the non 184V arm who actually had archive 184V, and and so that they're similar more because the groups are actually more similar than than different. But, yeah, yeah, I actually um, think this is a, a a proof of concept for this extremely. They special were, subset yeah. of patients. And uh, I don't think that this means we can do this. And I, you know, I, I, I th am a, a fan of dolutegravulamividine as a switch strategy in the patients who uh, don't have 184V. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. And I don't, I don't think we need to push it to include a group that for whom it wasn't really studied in a sufficiently powered trial. Um, just my, my opinion. Um, here's another group switched to two drug regimens. This is a, a typical uh, you know, cohort study from Europe, basically looking at um, 534 people with dolotegravir 3TC, 186 with dolotegravir rolpivirine, a bunch of smattering of other two drug regimens. And the reason to highlight this study is because it did occur, they did look at people who'd been on prior treatment failures. And in, tang in Tango and Salsa, the sort of pivotal trials that led to dolotegravulamidine's approval for switch, there were no virologic failures. Uh, and this one, they included them. And yet there was a very high success rate um, for dolotegravulamidine in particular with only 5%, uh, sorry, 0.5% um, having um, treatment failure. And you could see there was a history of a bunch of resistance mutations. This is not the same thing as what we just saw with people known 184V. In fact, most of, I spoke to the investigator, there really was not a strategy of including the patients who had resistance to the two drugs that they were on. That was a, in common in this study. So I think the message is if you're switching to two drugs, you should typically have full susceptibility of both of the drugs. And I've already presented at one study called Solar 3D, and this is Solar. <laughs> this one, I know what it stands for. It's switch, to oral, switch from oral to long-acting regimen. I like this uh, name. Anyway, we, we've already seen the results of this. This is people on stable Victavir FTC TAF, randomized to CAD, rolpivirine injectable every two months, or Stay on Bacteria FTC TAF, and we saw the non inferiority results uh, at a previous meeting. And at the beginning, they asked people, what, you know, why do you want to be in this study? We're, they were going to ask them about their treatment satisfaction and any challenges they're feeling. And, and they gave the typical reasons that people give when they want to go in injectables that they don't want to disclose. They don't have concerns about taking the pill every day. They don't like the daily reminder of HIV status. Um, and what it showed is that uh, after this study went forward, 12 months later, uh, after the switch, 
They had significantly improved treatment satisfaction. Most preferred being on long acting to their baseline regimen and a lower proportion had psychological social challenges. So kind of have a, a, a poll question here that is, you have to read it very carefully. So how would you describe the results of these patient reported outcome studies of cabroprivirine? So answer A is that it's reassuring that for people who wanna go in injectable, they like it. Option B, it's to be expected the otherwise wouldn't have entered the study. Option C, both A and B, or option D, neither A or B. All right, let's see what people say. All right, we have our votes and I agree with the 76% who say this is, <laughs> this is a combination of reassuring and a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, only people who want to go on an injectable go on an injectable study. And yes, they're happier once they get on an injectable. We, I don't know what your experience is with long-acting injectable, but it's a small fraction of our practice, uh, of our population. It's small, slowly growing. And the people around it, most of them really like it. Um, what, what is your experience? Yeah, no. I mean, we had quite a lot of pent-up demand for it because it took quite a lot while to get it rolling in our clinical situation. And uh, yeah, I have to say, I, I have seldom had some people come and hug me. They're so like, it's life-changing to them. There's just something like that, which is more than I expected. But I think um, one of the things is you can't actually guess who's going to really uh, like it or want it. And so it, you know, my practice has changed to be, I've presented as one of the available options. And I'm often surprised by who wants it and who doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just the best way to approach it because some people are really, uh, it does make a big, big difference for them. Bunch of challenges uh, in the United States that may be US specific, which is that we have such a chaotic, and that's putting it nicely, healthcare system that um, we don't really know how difficult the process is going to be to getting it for them till mm -hmm. after we apply for it. I see, yeah. You know, yeah. and so, you know, it's like, who knows? Um, but we, we explain that, you know, we said to the patients, most of our patients who go on this, they meet with our nurse practitioner who gives them full education piece and then says, okay, now we start the application process. It could be, we could hear as soon as, you know, within a week, or it could be several weeks, or it could be that your insurance plan doesn't want to cover it at all. Just uh, hang in there. <laughs> fortunately, yeah, no. fortunately, the people getting this are by and large, incredibly stable on their current treatment. So they can continue that. Okay, next, uh, I'm gonna talk about Bictegravir FTC TAF in pregnant women with HIV. Uh, this is a PK study and it compared levels of Bictegravir um, in the second and third trimester in pregnant women to levels six and 12 weeks postpartum. And you could tell I'm not a pharmacist because I'm not gonna give you all the details of the various measurements, but, <laughs> excuse me, it was done uh, <clears throat> in a very rigorous manner. Um, the results are shown here and in this figure, <clears throat> you'll note that in the green and the yellow that the total and unbound bactericular levels were uh, significantly lower in the second and third trimester. Um, so that's the, that's common in a lot of, um, in a lot of HIV drugs that they, because of the volume of distribution, the levels are lower during second and third trimester. But you'll note, uh, and I put it in red, the trough levels remain significantly above the protein adjusted inhibitory quotient, which is way down here. So this is the uh, concentration here and it's a log scale uh, and it's still, you know, more than, more than tenfold above it. Um, there were no women in the study who experienced virologic failure and no cases of, of transmission. 
the virus. Not surprising because it's just a, it's like a small study. I don't know, uh, Marina, do you have much experience with Pictegravir FTC TAF in pregnancy? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think this is important because it's, we need growing information to inform how we can use this drug because more and more women are actually on Pictegravir uh, when they uh, become pregnant. Um, and, you know, we have increasing confidence of using dolutegravir in pregnancy. And so that's been our preferred regimen, but we often don't control when the timing of pregnancy occurs. So the more we have to reassure us that, uh, you know, it's both um, achieves good uh, levels uh, as well as appears safe. Um, clearly, a study of this size can't talk to safety uh, long term, but uh, we shouldn't you know, really expect that there'd be any major differences in safety with this regimen compared to what we are now traditionally using as a first line regimen. So hopefully, we'll be able to move forward eventually with yeah. you know more confidence in recommending this as a as one of the preferred options. Yeah, I think it's you know I agree it's important. I, I think it's best for the women who are stable on their regimen, they're taking Pictegravir FTC TAF and then they show up and say, I think I might be pregnant because you know, clearly based on this, there's no uh, PK need to switch their treatment. This isn't like where you have to like double the dose of Darunavir or something exactly. saying like that. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll see. By the way, this is an important data point for you and that's why I, I highlighted this in red. Bictegravir levels are reduced, but above the levels required to inhibit the virus. All right, everybody's favorite section, uh, weight and metabolic abnormalities. I'm not really, I'm sort of saying that slightly, with slightly facetiously, it's, it's, not, it's not that it's uh, not our favorite section, it's that it's, it's unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot proven that we can do about this. Uh, epidemic of obesity. So first, I want to hand it to the folks at Janssen who sponsored an actual study, because so few studies are actually done in this area prospectively. And this was a switch study. Um, it was basically looking at people suppressed on their integrase plus TAF-based regimen with more than 10% increase in body weight over three years, then randomized to stay on their regimen or switch to Darunavir Cobacistat FCT TAF, and the primary endpoint is change in weight at week 24. Change in weight to week 24. And uh, results are shown here. It was not uh, no significant difference in weight changes over this six month period. In fact, if you look, the Darunavir Kobe arm has numerically higher. Uh, now, this is a, you could say, a, look at this in a bunch of ways. You could say, well, what do you expect? It's only six months. You could look at this and say uh, it's a small sample, therefore the confidence intervals are overlapping so much. You could look at this and say that the weight gain is that's art related is irreversible. Or you could say, well, it's not related to the agents at all. It's just related to the fact that stable people with HIV gain weight, unfortunately, like the general population gains weight, and it's very hard to modify that with regimen switches. Um, so in that vein, uh, I'm going to actually now talk about a, uh, a, a bigger data set, going back to our experimental Doravirinus-Latrovir, because remember Doravirinus-Latrovir has neither integrase or TAF. And you, you see here is that there's two studies. One is just anyone on baseline ART. This is an open label study. And this one is the baseline Bictegravir FTC TAF. And then they randomized to stay in those or switch to Doravirinus latrovir. And Grace McComsey presented this remotely from, from Cleveland, where I estimate it was about four in the morning when she presented it. <laughs> so thanks to her waking up. Um, and let me cut to the chase. Uh, it really is... Uh, no evidence of weight loss by these switches. In fact, there's a bit, bit of weight gain. And if you really drill down as to why did people gain weight switching to Deravirinus latrovir, I've highlighted in yellow the primary reason, which is baseline TDF and or favorins leads to significant weight gain when you switch off them. Uh, reasons are unclear. I've, I 
keep thinking about patients who come to us on this regimen because it still happens because there are people from TDFFTC ephedrines and there are reasons to switch off that regimen uh, having to do with bone, renal, neurocognitive side effects, but they should be cautioned that almost no matter what you choose, uh, they are likely to gain weight after the switch. And that was shown certainly in this derivative, this Latifir trial. And the last uh, study I wanna cite on, on weight has to do with uh, everyone's favorite drugs these days, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, small comparative case series from Cincinnati, looking at people with diabetes who have diabetes only, or diabetes plus HIV. They're matched by gender, ethnicity, and GLP-1 receptor agonist dose. And these are the changes in weight for the people with just diabetes versus people getting people with HIV. And even though it's a small comparison, that's highly significant, at least prompted the investigation. And the poster is interesting. There's some mechanistic reasons why they think why semaglutide and its relatives might be more effective in people with, with, uh, with HIV-related weight gain. All right, next poll question for you. Have you modified ART in a patient who has experienced significant weight gain? A, yes, and weight has decreased. B, yes, but weight has not decreased. C, no. All right, 11% have had success with this strategy, but that means that 89% have not had success with it, either because they haven't done it or because it didn't work. Marina? I admit to having tried it <laughs> at least once with an N of one where it worked, but I honestly think, yeah, when it's when you're in that context, you know, the person's obviously very motivated as well. So um, it's often hard to distinguish what's happening from um, you know, the other things they're doing in their life at the same time to make uh, weight uh, perhaps go down. What did you, what did you switch them well, to? This was, a, this was a really interesting young woman who, um, who was uh, a mother child transmission, always in, you know, very quite thin uh, on Genvoya. Uh, and uh, she, her mother had recently switched to Bic Chagravir and uh, Bic Tarby, and she wanted to be uh, on the same thing. So, so she switched, we switched her to that and she instantly gained weight, which was really wow. quite curious. She'd been well suppressed and there was no reason for her to do that. And so she wanted to go back off. So I put her back off and she lost weight again, which just doesn't make any you sense know. if you think about what drugs we're trying to yeah. switch weight. So, so it's hard to read into it, but um, she was convinced that it made a difference. And uh, yeah. There are some people, there are some studies that have shown that regimens that contain oh, PK booster, yeah. Yeah. whether it's ritonavir or um, cobacistat, yeah. do in fact have less weight gain associated with them. But maybe that effect was seen. Yeah. Certainly the, the only prospective data that really stands out is the switching back to TDF-based treatment. Yeah. I mean, it does seem to be, as opposed to uh, favorable, there seems to be a negative impact of certain drugs on, on weight. So we're seeing the unmasking of the, that yeah. when we the switches is what I think we're going to learn more about, but certainly if Averance falls into that category as well. Yeah, yeah, well. definitely. I thought it's fasc fascinating to think back. Um, I don't, you're not as old as I am, but but when when the lipodystrophy syndrome was first yeah. described, <laughs> everyone blamed the protease inhibitors, but you know it turns out that the yeah. first generation of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors were just as much to blame, but. We hadn't seen it before until the protease inhibitors showed up, so it must be them. Yeah, so exactly. the early literature on that topic is is frighteningly reminiscent of what we saw when dolutegravir first came online, and we switched people from efavirenz to dolutegravir, and suddenly dolutegravir causes weight gain. You know, so, exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to summarize a whole lot of studies on this one slide by saying that many of the presentations at IAS 
showed associations of integrase use with and without TAF and incident hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. In most, but not all, these risks paralleled increases in weight, so they really couldn't disentangle them. Uh, there was one exception that I want to bring out, this respond cohort. Remember, this respond cohort did initially find an association between um, uh, cardiovascular risk and INSTE's use, which later was not found when controlling for baseline characteristics. So they acknowledge that might be the case here, but this one at least is independent effect. I think we just need to keep keep using these drugs and keep getting more information about them. All right, next section, a couple of slides on prevention. Let me uh, highlight for you that I think Australia is the world's model for the HIV care system, care and research. Now, uh, you could say it's easy because it's only 30,000 people. But that's a big country. 30 million. <laughs> 30,000 30, people with HIV in the entire country. Entire country, yeah. Yeah, that's not a lot of people. On the other hand, it's a big country and they have coordinated their HIV care and research and prevention in ways that nobody else has. And their, their viral suppression rate for people diagnosed is now 97.8%. And they have tons of people on PrEP. And you know what you just said, uh, Marina, about, about seeing new diagnoses? They barely ever see new diagnoses. In urban areas in Australia, very uncommon. Uh, they do have some challenges remaining. It's not solved, obviously, but uh, I think if there's going to be a place where transmission of new HIV goes down to less than, you know, you know, serious declines in, in incidents must be going, are going on there already, which is very exciting. All right, next is a choice of, of PrEP after participating in HPTN 084. So these are women who it was shown that, that women at risk of HIV in Africa um, randomized to long-acting CAB versus oral TDF-FTC. We know that the cabotegravir was superior and at the end of the study, they were offered PrEP and they could choose from one or the other. And this is the uh, analysis of what they choose. You could see that for the women on cabotegravir, 88% chose cabotegravir, but even for the women on TDF-FTC, 53% uh, chose cabotegravir. So the majority of women chose cabotegravir by quite a bit, 78%. And I, I, I think these are interesting data in, in particular because we don't use a whole lot of cabotegravir for PrEP yet. Uh, and partially that has to do with you know, cost and logistics, but it shows that, that when given the choice, uh, this uh, patient population really prefers injectable. Um, and then the reasons why uh, are, are highlighted in, in this figure here. Um, and that the people who chose CAB, they were uh, less likely to live with their partners and more likely to have experienced recent physical intimate partner violence or have been paid for sex. So not having a form of PrEP that shows is a, was felt to be a desirable thing for them. So remember this slide for your uh, post-test question. After this study, more women chose CAB over TDF-FTC. Now, Jean-Michel Molina updated us on doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis for SDI prevention. He's the expert, and he mentioned that he would now recommend it for MSM and trans women who have sex with casual partners, one to two STIs in the past 12 months or more, and test negative at baseline, and this is how he does it. Doxycycline prefers monohydrate over hyclate with food and water one hour, at least one hour before bedtime and within 24 hours and no later than 72 hours following condomless sex. And uh, he has this funny comment, avoid of contact with pigs. 
Uh, and then he's got some monitoring advice here. And the, the pig's comment, he just went right, blew, blew right by it. So I emailed him and I said, I'm doing an IS update and would like to mention your summary on Doxypep. Can you clarify what you meant by avoid of contact with pigs? Is this because people who have contact with pigs have been shown to harbor doxy resistant chlamydia? And from one Jew to another, I asked him, I assume it's not a kosher thing. Uh, no, it's not a kosher thing. He said, it's about chlamydia suis. Pigs have doxycycline resistant chlamydia suis. Uh, and so he thinks people should be cautious, but he acknowledged that this is not that common. And I don't know, I think it's just funny to include that in the slide. By the way, this is his slide, but that's my picture of a pig that I got from Pixabay. Um, the other th important update from, from Jean-Michel was that this Doxyvax study, which we heard was a positive study of, men of gonorrhea prevention for the vaccine, men meningitis B vaccine, turns out that when they did the analysis again, they found a discrepancy between the interim results and the complete analysis. So even though it was reported as positive in the Doxyvax, presentation from Croy. In fact, it's it's not. We don't know yet. So final results are pending. So, uh, oops. Um, last thing is cure. Cure. These are the, uh, this is an amazing slide from the person who presented it, Dr. Saz Sirion. These are the five people who have been cured with a stem cell transplant with CCR5 negative donors. And these are some experiences in people who have wild type CCR5. And what happens when you stop ART, you could see they many of them have delayed rebound uh, seven months, nine months, but it's not sustained. So what was shown here was that this patient, who's called the Geneva patient, Diagnosed in 1990, you know, continuous viral suppression since 2005, developed something called a biphenotypic sarcoma, which I was not familiar with in, in 2018, and gets aggressively treated with a stem cell transplant that includes irradiation and uh, an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Wild type donor um, develops full chimerism. Um, Interviral therapy is stopped in November of 2021. They actually did it an interesting way. They, they stopped sequentially. I, I would have just stopped it all once or not stopped it at all. And uh, they haven't found the virus anywhere. You could see this is the HIV viral load, right? Uh, the patient is also losing the HIV an antibody responses and has... Uh, no detectable virus in tissue reservoirs. Uh, got a lot of attention, this report, because this is the longest someone's gone um, without ART after a stem cell transplant. Did you hear about this before the conference, uh, Marina? Yeah, there were like little bits about it. It's really, yeah, exciting. But big, really big, quest big question here is whether they will, it's just a matter of time before this person yeah. relapses, yeah. Yeah. whether the GVHD, graft versus host disease is playing a role. Anyway, to wrap up, treatment, summarize big points here. Deravirin, Islatravir, non-inferior to BF-TAF, study being redone with lower dose of Islatravir. Dolotigravir, lamivudine, looks good, is without genotypes, initial look, we'll see. You can resuppress people with dolotigravir pretty, pretty easily. And bictegravirs are lower in pregnancy, but still substantially above what's needed. Uh, weight and cardiometabolic abnormalities. Mostly, I want people to focus on switching off TDF, especially with efavirenz, leads to weight gain, uh, because the other switches have not yet been shown to do the opposite, to lead to weight loss. For prevention, uh, probably the most important aside from praising Australia, is that after the CAB versus TDF-FTC prep study, more women chose cabotegravir. 
and data uh, on, I think diet guidelines are gonna change with doxycycline soon. All right, now you get to two your, your questions again. This is about bictegravir in pregnancy. Um, levels are unchanged, levels reduced and below levels to suppress virus, levels reduced but still above levels to suppress virus, or more increased levels go up with bictegravir and leads to more adverse events. Ninety-eight percent get the answer correct. That's great. And I showed you these data, and I don't need to show them again. And the next question is: choosing regimen for prep after the participation in 084. They want to choose either cabotegravir or TDFFTC. The women who participated, more women chose TDFFTC over cab. More women chose cab over TDFFTC. No clear preference, or most women didn't participate at all. Ninety-nine percent. You are a very learned group. I want to take a moment to uh, show the data and then show this picture of the Pacific Ocean that I took from Lamington National Park in Queensland. Uh, and I'll stop sharing. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Paul. That was great. I think uh, a great roundup of a of a really interesting meeting. I sometimes we don't see such uh, potentially practice changing stuff presented at the. Uh, yes, but this year may have been, you know, an example. And then uh, Australia, always a great host. Uh, they really know how to showcase, uh, as you mentioned, how to how to do things clinically, and also, but how to do research and, and really integrate the two together. So I think we have a lot to learn from, from our hosts at that meeting. Um, I think we have a little bit of time, a few minutes left. Um, and there were some questions that came up during, during the the uh, question and answers over the course of the presentations. And I, I think one of the things you kind of come away with is we're making lots of progress with, you know, simplifying treatments to one tablet a day or even injectables. And on the other hand, now we're talking about how we have to add more therapies to counteract some of the longer term side effects. So reprieve being, you know, the first where we're talking about, does everybody need a statin? Um, and, uh, and if so, um, uh, what about are there groups maybe for whom we don't need to be using this right now? Yeah. I think. No, I, I, first, I want to emphasize older than 40. Uh, and then the people at the very lowest risk, um, I would I would still, I'm, an, I'm a therapeutic nihilist. Uh, <laughs> and so even though I almost became a cardiologist, I would not recommend it for that group. So if, they're, if you're below the 5%, I'm kind of like, I could go either way. I wouldn't strongly recommend it, but that 5% and above is the group that I think this study really highlights the benefits of statin therapy. And there, there were some questions, I think, uh, also about what risk score was being used, but I think you showed that in your slide that it's the ASCVD risk score that they used yep. in, in Retrieve, but do we have to think about that risk score and make some adjustment due to HIV? Uh, yeah, is it yes. actually capturing risk adequately? Some people and say no. Some people yeah. say that you should use the you know, the European HIV risk score. Um, to, to my mind, uh, this this risk score is commonly used by so much. It's, it's, it's not meant to be precise, but it gives you kind of a general sense. Remember, it doesn't take into account family history. I mean, it's there's a whole bunch of problems. But if you're seeing, you know, a, a, a person in their early 60s who's not on a statin, and you get a 7.8% cardiovascular risk score. Yeah. I think this reprieve right pretty now. much yeah. tells you that it's time to start them, even though I, you might not have previously. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and I, I also think that there's a little, little signal there to follow up on, and it's also gonna be increasingly something we're gonna be concerned about with the weight gain story is, is diabetes. And, and whether, you know, where does that risk benefit fall if there is actually an excess risk of diabetes? Because although it's a similar to the general population, there definitely did seem to be a difference between those exposed and not exposed oh, yeah. to that. And so, so um, you know, balancing that with weight, which isn't part of the risk score, I think we're also going to have to be thinking about right. it. In the I do think uh, it's reassuring that the, the studies of patavastatin 
versus other statins do not suggest that pitavastatin is more likely to cause diabetes right. than other statins. It's sort of comparable. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And then I guess if we want to move to some of the other stuff regarding, you know, um, uh, uh, use of dual therapies and is there a role uh, for trying to better get a handle on whether 184V is present, the role of proviol RNA testing in, I mean, in clinical practice, does it have a role? Um, yeah. And... I mean, I can tell you the, the setting in which we have found proviol resistant testing most useful. It's in people who are asking to go on cabropivirine who have unclear treatment histories. And we are not that comfortable with it, but we've been able to order that test a few times and find uh, that they're they're not a good candidate, that they have ropivirine resistance. And, and you know, that that really is the leading risk factor for cap ropivirine failure. Um, for dolotegravir or lumividine, I, you know, I think you can just do a, his, do a careful history. You look through their history and they've never had treatment failure. You know, they've, they've then they, you don't need to do a genotype, yeah. uh, or a genotype for them. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing is, you know, this is in the uh, assumption that, and correctly, that we are monitoring people after the switches. So that yeah. one of the things that has been observed is that if there is a failure soon after the switch, then going back to the previous therapy actually suppresses people almost all the time. So, and exactly. that sort of speaks to the this, you know, the study about how people who stop their treatment, you, you know, restart them on on, on integrated based therapy afterwards. Uh, right. You, you, you suppress so. I think, provided that people aren't disappearing off and you never see them again, I think we're... That's right, <laughs> important happen. caveat. It might not be the people who you should be doing this with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're at or over time okay. already. It was really a great interest from the from the audience and uh, really a fantastic presentation. Um, I, I, I just want to say that that was a scene from A Night at the Opera. And I think Mike Sag, who is a big... Mike Sag picked it up in the... He's a big, big Groucho Marx fan is the one who picked it up. So great. So I guess we can close now. Uh, and again, thank the audience for participating and uh, ISUSA for putting this on. Uh, I, just to remind you that there are... Uh, evaluate information about evaluations and how to claim CME credits. Um, and we really appreciate your feedback because it helps us improve sessions for the future. Uh, and just to bring your attention to uh, other sessions that are coming up, this is one uh, about long acting drugs, which we talked a bit about today. Uh, and uh, here are the other uh, things coming soon in the pipeline. So really some exciting presentations. Um, so look forward to welcoming you to these ones in the future. Um, and thank you again for participating. So thanks, Paul. Always thanks, Marina. Enjoyed it. Bye.